Hello, my name is Stiley Hayward. I would like to welcome you to the Blessed Hope Ministry. We are a King James Grounded Family Bible Study. These lessons are not to be a substitute for regular church attendance. Nightly, I direct my family through the Bible by chapter and verse. We request you to join us and to study from God and His Son, Jesus Christ. You may have permission to like, send, or encourage our studies with family or friends. Edification of what God has and what He desires in our life. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly divine the word of truth. You may use our studies, but I request that you do not abuse them. For YouTube videos, subscribe below for more videos. And place the thumbs up and leave a comment or email me. Thank you. Numbers chapter 14. Now the spies have gone in. They've come out, land flow of milk and honey, but there's giants. As a family, we, we read through the Bible through the year. We just read there were giants before Israel was around. There are giants afterwards. David. From Noah to David, there are giants through the Bible. And these giants were so powerful, they would have overpopulated the world. But they didn't. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. Ten men go in, spies. Two of them are for God. Two of them, let's go conquer. Ten of them has caused the entire congregation, an entire nation to reject God in his word. This is to fulfill the whole thing they left Egypt to go into this promised land. The land that your fathers give is promised. The land that I'll give to you. The land that flows with milk and honey. Ten men come back with an evil report. And look, look how the congregation of Israel is. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses. It's not his fault. And against Aaron. It's not his fault. And the whole congregation said unto them. Would God that we had, uh, that we had died in the land of Egypt. You were. Unto God has brought you out under the Passover. Brought you through a land that your shoes didn't rot. Your clothes remained on you. You were fed by manna. Or would God we had died in this wilderness. Better shut up because you're going to. You see that right there? God's going to take them at that word. Because watch next. And wherefore hath the Lord brought us unto this land, the, the land promised to them, to fall by the sword, war. That our wives, okay, now our children should be a prey. Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? There's two things in these two verses. Oh, that we would die in this wilderness and our poor children. Our children are going to be slain. We'll see those in a minute. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. We're going to go back. We have given up on God. We have given up on the God's promises. We're going back. What makes you think Egypt would retake them back after all what God's done with them? What's going to happen when you go back to that Red Sea? You think it's going to open it up? You think it's going to be dry land? And Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. Man, they hit the ground. Did they forget where they were in Egypt as slaves? Rigor? And Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes out of the entire nation. Four men are on the ground. Four men have rent their clothes. They are pleading to God. Four people. Moses, Aaron, Joshua, and Caleb. In the assembly of God. And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through. Now this is, would be Joshua and Caleb. The land which we had passed through to search it 
is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delight in us, after what you guys are doing right now, after your conduct right now, one of these men is saying, if the Lord delight in us, he's not happy right now, then he will bring us into the land, this land, and give it us a land which floweth with milk and honey. 13, 27. And they told him, said, we came unto the land whither thou sent us, and surely it floweth with milk and honey. That's what God said. That floweth with milk and honey. You, you want an interesting Bible? Flowing with milk and honey shows up 12 times in your Bible. Each case for one of the 12 tribes of Israel. The 12 divisions that the land will be divided in Joshua. Floweth with milk and honey 12 times in the Bible. Only rebelled not. They are rebelling. They're talking about going back. Joshua or Caleb or both of them. You know the message they're preaching? Repent. Because they're already talking about rebelling, going, going back. So the only thing they would be preaching now is repent and let's go forward. Only rebel not against the Lord. Neither fear ye the people of the land. For they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them. And the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Well, that's remarkable. Here all the people are fearing. Here all the people are upset. And one of these men that did go in there, Joshua or Caleb, are like, let's go. Let's take over. Let's get in there. Let's do it. By God, we can do these two men believe in the promises of God where an entire nation won't. But all the congregation bad stoned them with stones. That's not the first time it's happened. And this is the same reaction you get in the Gospels in the Gospel of John with Jesus. They bound to stone him. You know what the nation's doing right now that you see in the gospel of Jesus? Crucify them! Crucify them! we rather have Rome. we rather go back to Egypt. So, I, I would assume Moses and Aaron are still in their faces. And I, I would assume that Caleb and Joshua are trying to get the people right. And they're going to crucify. Well, they're going to stone the preachers. And the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of it. That sounds good. The glory of the Lord. Doesn't that sound good? Well, it's not. Even amongst rebellion, God's in his glory. And the Lord said to Moses, he's down on his face. How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be er? They believe, they believe me. It's unbelief. For all the signs which I have showed among them. Do you see Jesus Christ? The multitudes of healing. The, the, the devils being taken out of the bodies. John says we can't even contain all the books that Jesus did. And finally, what do the people cry out at the end of Jesus' time? Kill him. Crucify him. So that nation in 1,500 years has not changed. That nation 3,000 years has not changed. 4,000 years have not changed. They're doing the same thing they're, they're doing to Caleb. And Joshua that they'll do to Jesus. Joshua, I would say, I assume by scriptures is the one preaching, if not Caleb too. Joshua is the one I assume that they want to stone with stones. And now we start seeing Joshua become a type of Christ Jehovah saves. And Joshua is going to be the one that takes them in the promised land. After the law dies. So start picking up on Joshua now. 
So when Moses died and, and, and Joshua is put in charge of Israel, don't think that they love Joshua because look what they're doing to him right now. God's still speaking. I will smite them with pestilence. Well, that's not good. And disinherit them. Now, if God would do that to them, they, they would die and go to hell. And will make of thee, Moses, a greater nation and mightier than they. So God is so angry, get rid of Israel. I will make of you, Moses, another better nation. And to be the children of Moses and not the children of Israel. This is how angry God gets. That loving God says, I I'm finished with them. His people. And thank God for Moses to step in for the people. And Moses said unto the Lord, Well, God, then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them. God, you're powerful. And they're going to hear. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people. That thou, Lord, art seen face to face. And that thy cloud standeth over them. And that thou goest before them. By daytime in a pillar of cloud. And in a pillar of fire by night. Now if thou shalt kill all this people. You see, you see what Moses is telling you? All this people as one man. Then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them. Therefore he has slain them in the wilderness. God, he's unable to do what he, he says to do. Now, We are talking about the oath of God. We're talking about a covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob by God's mouth. Now God has to be held to it. What's the assurance that we have that Jesus saves and I am saved forever? By the Old Testament story of how angrily God was set before the Jews. There are still Jews today. When we read Numbers 14, had not Moses stepped in, there would ever not ever come in a Jew ever to be. But they are God's people. And by the word of God to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that land is their land and God is held to his word. And when God says, if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I am saved, I'm not going to hell. I am held by the word and by the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know who steps in when God gets angry with me when I rebel and sin against him? Jesus. Father, calm down. Yeah, he's human. He's a sinner, but he's ours. He's our son. And I shed my blood and I died on that cross for him. I think I'm I think I hear him confessing his sins. Now you you are just and you're right, God. You gotta forgive those sins that he just confessed. That's what Jesus is doing right now. That when when we sin. As children of God, as Israel are children of God. So we're looking at our own lives that God does get angry when we sin. Then the mediator steps in and it's not Mary. It's not Miriam. It's Moses and God. It's Jesus and God. And God's ready to kill him. And now I beseech thee, Moses, to speak and let the power of my Lord, capital L, be great. According as thou hast spoken, saying, the Lord is long-suffering. Had he killed Israel, that long-suffering would never happen. Why hasn't God come back when these Christians speak about the rapture? Why hasn't it happened yet? Long-suffering. When you go knocking on doors every week, when you go to that spot and you preach, when you go pass out gospel tracts where you are, and people say, I'm sick and tired of you being here. Why are you always here? Long-suffering. God's not willing that any should perish. And of great mercy. 
forgiving iniquity and transgression. That's God. And by no means clearing the guilty. You're guilty. You're guilty. Visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children under the third and fourth generation. Now that cause is found with those who have idolatry. Pardon, I beseech thee, Moses, stepping in for the people. Jesus stepping in for us. Pardon means you are guilty. In the dictionary and in the law court, I don't care what they do with presidents. But in the law and the dictionary, pardon means you have to admit that you have guilt. If you are not guilty by your own pretense, there is no pardon. Pardon, I beseech thee, the iniquity of this people according unto the greatness of thy mercy. Moses is stepping in and saying we are guilty. And Moses hasn't done anything. And you'll see Jeremiah, you'll see Ezekiel, and you'll see Daniel stepping in saying, as a nation, we are guilty. And as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt even unto now, and it's been a long journey, all the time God's forgiven them. It's been a long journey since I've been saved, and all the times God's forgiven me. And the Lord said, I have pardoned according to thy word. Talking to Moses. Okay, I pardoned him. Look at that. I pardoned him. According to thy word. Now, what is it with Jesus? The father looks to the son and says, okay, I pardon him. To your merit. To what you've done. To that you suffered and died and bled for them. I pardoned it. And you got to come to God for the pardon and say, hey, I'm a sinner, 1 John 1, 9. you got to confess that sin. And the, and the son goes to the father and says, Father, he's, he, you're angry with him. And you are holy and you are right to be angry with him. But he's, ju he's just confessed that sin and you have to pardon him. And the father has to say, okay. The Old Testament ain't a boring dead book. It's live and living today. But, uh-oh. But, that's not a good but. As truly, there's a reason. As truly as I live God forever, eternal. All the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. That's the millennium. Jesus Christ. Because all those men. Going to be the ten spies. Which have seen my glory and my miracles, which I did in Egypt, in the wilderness, have tempted me these ten times. God knows how many times. And there's two reasonings here. First of all, a lot of these people did not confess their sins. Some did, some didn't. And the, the sacrifice of bulls and goats and, and oxen and all that cannot take away your sin. Now, as far as me as a born-again Bible-believing Christian, and you are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. They don't come back and haunt me. As far as the eyes of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, my flesh may have to reap and sow. God says ten times they've done this to me. And if I confess my sins correctly and proclaim the pardon of God through Jesus Christ. God doesn't know how many times I lied when it's under the blood. He cannot say tempted me now. He 436,221 times he's lied. He can't say that. Because 1 John 1 9 says through the blood of Jesus Christ. As far as the east and from west, he doesn't remember my sins. On the Old Testament, it's counted. Until Jesus suffers and dies and is buried and rose from the grave. And then those that are in Abraham's bosom, bosom then they are clean and they're washed. Never to be remembered. Have not hearkened unto my voice. Surely 
They shall not see the land which I swear unto their fathers. Uh oh. Now this pictures a lost man that God says, you're not coming to New Jerusalem. You're not coming to the new earth. And you sure ain't going to the new heavens. There's only one other place for you. Hell. Neither shall any of them that provoke me see it. They've angered God to the, to the eleven too many times. But here's a good but. A lot of buts I say are bad, but here's a good but. But my servant, Caleb. My servant, Caleb. He, God names his name. And there's times in your life that you want to be named by God. And here's one of them times. Imagine Caleb. Who is he? He's on the lips of God. Because he had another spirit with him. He didn't have the spirit of those ten other men. Their spirit was unbelief in God in his finished work. And has followed me fully. Him will I bring into the land whereunto he went, and his seed shall possess it. God calls out one man, and later on he's going to call out uh, uh, Joshua. Now, can you imagine those two men, those ten men are standing around right now? And if God's audio, I don't know if it's just Moses can hear or the people can hear. But if all the people can hear, can you imagine those ten men sitting there right now and say, well, Caleb gets to go in. Imagine what came upon their heart. If they even cared. Now, the Amalekites. Now, those are the ones of Esau. And the Canaanites. That's one of, of Ham. Dwell in the valley. Tomorrow turn you and get you into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Start going backward. What's saying? You're not going forward now. You're going backward. Backsliding, we call it. From where they are right now, all they had to do is cross the line right there, and they would have been in the promised land. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 1 real quick. See, let's see how close they were. Deuteronomy 1, 2. And there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. There they are right now. And it came to pass in the 40th year. It was 11 days journey 40 years later. They're right back where they are in Deuteronomy 1 as Moses prepared the right for the people that are going in the land. And he's going to die. That's how bad it is. They they turn back. 11 day journey. And 40 years later. They are right back to where they were. And the Lord spake unto Moses. And unto Aaron. Now Aaron saying. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation? Which murmur against me. I, oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I thought verse 2. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. God took it personally. As much as Paul. When, when Jesus said. Why persecute out of me? Listen. Paul never persecuted Jesus once. He was persecuting children of God. And rest assured, if you are living right and doing right, and you're getting persecution, and you're getting sash, you're getting trouble, you're getting people lying about you, getting mistreated, God says they're doing it to me if you do it right. I have heard the murmuring to the children of Israel, which they murmur against me, God speaking. Say unto them, as truly as I live, oh, that's an oath by God, the eternal God, saith the Lord, as ye have spoken in my ears, so will I do to you. Watch what you say. Look at verse 3. 
And wherefore hath the Lord brought us in the land to fall by the sword, that our wives and our children should be prey? Were it better for us to return in, into the wilderness, uh, the Egypt, excuse me. In verse 2, would God we die in the wilderness? Better be careful what you say. God heard that. They are speaking to Moses and Aaron. Good, we just die right here. Thank you, you idiots. We're going back. And Lord's up in, up in heaven saying, hmm. Open your big fat trap again, didn't you? Now watch this. Now let me read verse 2 with you, and I'll read verse 29. Complain to Moses and Aaron. Or would God we had died in the wilderness... Your carcasses shall fall in this wilderness. They got exactly what they wanted. And that's not what they wanted. They're just angry. And it's going to take 40 years. And all that were numbered of you, according to your whole number, what we just read in Numbers 1, 2, and 3. From 20 years old and upward. So anyone 19 and younger are going to live. Anyone over 20 is going to die in that 40 years. And they're going to march around 40 years till all those people die. So the youngest of the congregation of Israel that will go in the promised land under Joshua... I'm trying to do the math in my head. Forgive me. 40 and 19. 59 years old. That would be the maximum age when they go in. And if a young child is born right now, where we are, 40 years. He'll be 40 years old when he goes in. If I got that math correct. And upward, which have murmured against me. Doubtless, he shall not come into the land concerning which I swear to make you dwell in. Here we go. Say Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Many that go the broad way, and the few that go the straight gate. Even Moses doesn't go in because of anger. Now, can you imagine if you were in that group and you did hear only two people and not you by name and anybody under age 20, you're going in, but the rest of you are not. So 40 years from now, Caleb is going in. 40 years from now, Joshua is going in. And we get the age later on, Caleb. I think. He's 80 when he, I think he's eight, I think he's 40 now and 80 when he goes in, I believe. Say 20 years old, they can go in. It says from 20 years old. From 20. Upward. That means they can be 20. No, from 20 years old and upward, that's when they're going to die. Uh. But your little ones. All right, let's go back over here again. Verse 3. That our wives, that, leave that out, that don't go. Our children should be a prey. So, but your little ones, which ye said, shall be a prey. See, God heard what they said. So God answered a prayer. You're going to die in the wilderness, but I'll take care of your children. God heard that. Your little ones, which ye said, should be a prey. Then will I, God, bring in, and they shall know the land which ye have despised. It had been better, verse 3, for us to be in Egypt. Do you know God's listening? And you know how Satan takes that away from you? He writes this, a, a, a song about Santa. He knows what you're doing. He knows if you're good. He knows if you're bad. He better not power. He, he writes that all about Santa Claus. But he doesn't tell you that's God. And there's been many of a Christian. Who's opened his big fat mouth in anger and in defeat, and God has held him to his words. 
And not even just Christians, but how many people who've been on the battlefield? Oh, God, if you get me out of this, they're in, they're in the, the trenches. And God, if you get me out of this, I'll be that preacher my mother wants me to be. And Lord, if you get me home, back, back to my family, back, I will go to church all the time. God hears it. Anything you get out of Numbers chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, and 29 and 30, 31, God hears you, and they're not even right with God, and God says, I heard that. You better get that. You better realize your big mouth. Jesus said, again, it's in Matthew, every idle word you shall give an account. But as for you, your carcasses, they shall fall in the wilderness. That's what they said. And your children shall wander in the wilderness 40 years and bear your whoredoms. Now listen, were they paying for sexual relations? No, they weren't. They were griping. They were murmuring. They were angry there was no food. They were angry there was no water. They are lusting. They are falling to other gods. Until your carcasses be wasted in the wilderness. So in that wilderness today, if you were to go take a shovel, there's a bunch of bones being buried. Or were buried, excuse me. <coughs> and those were the people that angered God. After the number of the days in which ye searched the land, even 40 days, and look at uh, 1325, and they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. The spies were in the land for 40 days. Verse 34. Each day for a year, reaping what you sold. God, well, you know, I gave that up, but I, I still got this, this enjoyment in my body. Lord, he didn't take away from the children of Israel. He said, you walked in that land for 40 days. I'm going to make it 40 years. A thousand years is one day. And a thousand, uh, and one day is as a thousand years, recorded by Peter. Talking about reaping and sowing. Why not God just have them wipe them completely out right now and someone's got to raise those children. You're going to raise those children and die and go off into hell if you don't get right. So those children can go in the promised land and under Joshua. Because if you were to wipe them out right now, you got a bunch of, um, say, one day old maybe to 19 years old. What are they going to know? Moses and Aaron are just going to have a bunch of babies under their hand. So God is able to take wicked parents and raise up a child for his honor and glory. That's going with Joshua. You cannot say, well, it was the circumstance that I was born in. These children that are now going to go in the promised land under Joshua have wicked parents that told God, we want to go back. We don't believe in you. We hate you. I'm sick and tired of this manna. And we're going to die, but you're going to go in the promised land. That's interesting. So 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities. Even 40 years, ye shall know my breach. Breach. And an act of breaking. A state of being broken. Breach of promise. Exodus 12, 25. God promised, but you guys broke it. Now that's the first law word. Well, actually the second law word with pardon. Pardon, you must be guilty. Breach is a broken. When you go to before a judge and someone has charged you with breach, you have broken a promise and oath that you made. I, the Lord, have said, God's mouth, God's word, I will surely do it unto all this evil congregation that are gathered 
together against me, verses 1, 2, and 3. I thought they were against Moses and Aaron again. Uh-uh. Against God. God took it personally. In this wilderness, they shall be consumed, and there shall they die. Now, all the journeys that they've done through the wilderness so far came to no merit at all. Because they're going to go back, and they're going to die there. And the men, which Moses sent to search the land. Now, remember, we read in Deuteronomy, they wanted to spies. God said, go ahead, go ahead and do it. I know it's going to happen, but go ahead and do it. And Moses picked them. That's all Moses did was wrong. He picked the men. Turned and made all the congregation to murmur against him. By bringing up a slander, there's another law term. When you're charged with slander, you are charging that something is true. You are calling it false. You are making a liar here of God. I don't want that charge at any judgment of God. Can you imagine you're standing before God, Jesus Christ, and he charges you lying? By bringing up a slander upon the land. Oh, we can't go in because of the giants. Even those men that did bring up the evil report. We looked at that last night. It's like changing the word of God. Changing the Bible. Verse 32 of chapter 13. And they brought up an evil report of the land. They changed the word of God. God says, I've given you the land. They said, no, we can't get the land. Because of italicized words or because of giants. Same thing. For, he, for those men which did bring up an evil report of the land, that's not Joshua and that's not Caleb. Died by the plague before the Lord. So they died. And you say, God, how cruel, because the entire congregation is affected. Yeah, but verse 1, and all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept. The whole entire congregation said, we're going back. The congregation said, the entire congregation said, we don't believe God. Those ten men started it, but they kept it going. And we are warned in the New Testament by Jesus, by Paul, by Peter, by James, by the writers of the New Testament, by Jude. Do not follow the deceivers. And that's exactly what those ten men did. They deceived the people and look how it grew into the entire congregation that only two men out of ten, I don't know what the percentage of that is, are going in the promised land, and only those that are 19 and younger are going in that promised land. Deceivers cause much trouble. They cause much damage. And again, they're warned by Jesus. They're warned by the, the books in the New Testament. And many will go, listen, the churches are in a mess they are today because of a deceiver. Mega churches are followed by one or two deceivers in that ministry. Don't marvel when you say, well, how come that church has got a million people in it? How come the entire nation of Israel under 10 men have gone against God? A mega nation, a mega church is the same sins. There's nothing new under the sun, Solomon wrote. But Joshua, he was one of the 12. But Joshua, the son of Nun. Two of 12, here it is. 17% of those spies went into the promised land. Two of 12 is 17%. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that went to search the land, lived still. Two survivors of the spies. The other 10 died of a plague. I wonder how bad that, and it just says plague. It doesn't even say what it was. And you know what? I believe with Joshua and Caleb, they were so sure of God when the plague started hitting those men. I mean, just, you guys should have done right. I got the joy, joy, joy down deep in my, and you just see Caleb knowing Joshua. I'm getting that mountain. I think they're going to write a hymn about that. I want that mountain. All right, all right, Caleb, we'll get there. We got 40 more years ago. I'm counting it down. 
the point of Joshua and Caleb made little marks. We're getting there. And Moses told these sayings unto the children of Israel, and the people mourned greatly. Now here's a mourning that you see in Corinthians. They're not godly mourning. They were caught wrong. They were caught in their sin, and they're sorry they're not getting the land. They hadn't repented. And there's a difference between worldly sorrow and godly sorrow. And here's worldly sorrow. Because had they had godly sorrow, they would have gotten on their knees. They would have brought an offering. And they would truly sought God to get right. No one's done it. And they rose up early in the morning. And got them up to the top of the mountain. Saying, Lo, we be here. And we go up unto the place which the Lord has promised, for we have sinned. That's not a true repentance by the action of God. Just because someone said, I have sinned, King Saul, Simon the sorcerer, the book of Acts, he was baptized and he was still wrong. We can't be fooled by everyone who says we have sinned. It may be a worldly ungodly sorrow and Moses said well watch the action of the preacher wherefore now do ye transgress the commandment of the Lord you are making more sin but aren't they repenting aren't they getting right he says you just added more to it but it shall not prosper go not up for the Lord is not among you I thought they got right but they said we sinned that ye be not smitten before your enemies. Now here God says don't go. Oh, we're going to go. Man always gets it opposite. Don't eat that fruit. Hmm, that was good. Go eat all the world and preach the gospel. Oh that's good that you do that. Uh, you guys keep doing it. We'll just do what we do. Let our light shine. Don't go. For the Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you, and ye shall fall by the sword, because ye are turned away from the Lord. They didn't turn back. They turned away. Backsliders. Therefore the Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go. Again, like that slander, they're supposed that this is the true. But it's not. They presumed to go up Unto the hilltop. Nevertheless, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and Moses departed not out of the camp. Then the Amalekites came down, and the Canaanites, which dwelt in the hill, and smote them and discomforted them, even unto harm. They're always disobeying God. Moses told them, Don't go. We're going to go. We're going to fight. Okay, we'll stay here. Don't kill yourselves. <laughs> 